Okay, the recording has started. We are going to get started with our third session of keeping your brailler clean during COVID-19. Tim and Carl are back with us today. We're very lucky to have them. Um, this session is being recorded. If you would like ACV, REP, CEUs, the opening code for tonight is OIL, O-I-L, OIL. I'm going to put it in the chat box. Our opening code is OIL. I would like to welcome and thank Mary. She is our captioner for tonight. If you would like closed captioning, you can just um, press the little arrow to the right of the live transcript CC button on your bottom menu, and you can turn on the closed captioning. Thank you, Mary, for doing that for us. Hopefully everyone is starting with their plates off. Carl has his plates off, I see. Um, he is ready to go. Hopefully everybody else is. If not, uh, I guess let, we, we should time you and see how fast you can do it at this point. This is session three. Um, so we are lucky to have Tim and Carl from Ancient City Brailler Repairs with us, and I am going to turn it over to them right now. Good afternoon. My name is Carl Jacobson, um, and with me is Tim Puck. Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to um, start with the brailers off, or the brailers off, the plates off today. Um, and just to field a couple questions, some of y'all sent some questions in. One of them was um, to demo the apron, which we'll cover that today. Um, another one was to, um, uh, on the bottom of the braille rider, there are two large holes when we put the bottom plate on and then we wanted to talk about those. So we'll, um, that's where we adjust the pressure on the beam and we'll demonstrate that today. And then um, someone's braille rider flipped over. When they flipped the braille rider over, the paper guide fell out. So we'll talk about um, that as well. And then O-rings for purchase, um, when they get um, um, dry and start to crack, somebody asked, can we buy those at Perkins. Uh, you can, they're 15 cents an O-ring, um, but uh, the repair is um, pretty complex. Um, and um, so I don't think we'll be able to get to that during these sessions, but um, we'll be glad to help um, in any other questions um, from that perspective. And then the last question is, what do you do with stubborn residue when normal grease um, and things like that come off, but um, really sticky products sometimes stickers get in there, um, you know, people put the wrong types of uh, grease in there that can get really sticky. Um, what are some options other than um, rubbing alcohol? And Tim, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, there's all kinds of solvents out there. Um, what we've found from a home consumer perspective, I've used denatured alcohol. It's definitely um, a lot more um, <laughs> flammable for sure. So be very, have it in an open space. Um, but that can work as well. And I've even um, used like um, uh, paint thinner as well for some of that stuff, but a little goes a long way. Um, I wouldn't try to let it go get on uh, very long. But um, now someone said that the sticker was on the uh, roller itself. And so that may actually um, cause some of the rubber um, on the, um, the O-rings to, to degrade. So just be mindful of, of some of that stuff. You may have to ask um, some questions at the local hardware store um, and kind of, you know, Braille is mainly metal, but there are some parts that are, um, that have rubber as well. So. Well, what they used to use a while back was the mineral spirits. Yes. That's which, another one too. Yeah, um, I you. personally don't like um, just because of it's, it's got a, it creates a residue on like your hands and on the machine itself. And yeah. so the, and I've only used it a very few times and I've never been impressed. And it's also, I think it's more because you have to sit there and now something that you've already quote unquote cleaned, you now have to re-clean and wipe down because if yeah. you leave that on there, um, the, um, the uh, grease that we showed everybody last week 
that will just start to cake on along with the mineral spirits and will create that whole gummy situation that we spoke about. Yeah, it's kind of a catch-22. I think the, the best uh, thing is using really tiny uh, picks like we talked about before um, over here and, um, you know, some elbow grease and try to pick away at some of that stuff. Um, and if you let the alcohol sit and, um, you know, for five, 10 minutes, if you can, um, just kind of keep reapplying, keeping it um, moist for lack of a better term. And then you can work away with a small uh, flathead screwdriver or a pick. So, okay. Are there um, any uh, questions showing up in the, the chat that maybe uh, we can write down if we can't get to it today? Um, we'll definitely try to um, answer it um, next week. So have those coming. Um, you guys mentioned you wanted to see the differences between a classic brailler and a light touch brailler. So we've seen the classic brailler. This is still the same one that we've that's been open for the past three sessions. So I'm going to put this off to the side and show you guys the um, the light touch brailler. And then, of course, I'm an overachiever. So if anybody has a one handed um, brailler, I open that up as well. So you can see that those differences as well. So um, I'm going to um, switch to the um, snake cam because I feel like we can um, get a little more uh, up close and personal with some of these brailers. So just give me a second. Carl's doing that. I can all speak a little bit to the light touch. So the light touch, um, we did go over it. I can't remember. I believe is after time. So I think some people may have signed out last week. But when we were talking about it, Perkins came through this light touch to really, I mean, it was, it's cost analysis for them. They have to figure out the best way to make these while they're still effective. And, but trying to save money on their own, own end. And so as Carl goes through here, you'll see the differences. Obviously, we all know like the color, your serial numbers are going to start with LT, everything like that. Um, but when we start looking at them like this, you're, the notice, uh, the differences you're going to see is in any of the assembly housing. So right now, Carl's camera is on the light touch brailler. And as you can see, you can see through it. You can see the top of the chain, bottom of the chain. You can, you can see through the brailler, so all the keys from underneath, everything else. But if he were to go back to the classic braille writer, you can't see any of that. It's all, it's all enclosed um, right there. It's all enclosed. Everything um, is kind of tighter. These brailers have a tendency to kind of hold their, when I say hold their shape, there's sometimes a repair where Carl and I will have to uh, realign an entire brailler. So we have to loosen up the entire frame and kind of give it a few taps and then realign it. And what we find that happens with these light touch brailers many times is that because of the material that was taken away, because of the metal that's not there anymore, um, there's a little more fluidity in it, but it causes the brailler to kind of um, get out of whack a little faster. Yep. And so we're looking at the front right now. And like Tim mentioned, the assemblies literally have a hole by the mainspring. Uh, holes by the keys um, and basically like cost is one but to cut weight that was uh, apparently in the 70s a, a complaint from TVIs that you know um, kids were lugging around you know eight to ten pounds of, of brailler and so they brought it down I think they're pushing closer to five maybe six um, and so in terms of the steel that's one thing in the front I'm going to flip the brailers and we can look at the back as well so you can see um, and the back assembly you think of it as a spine and the rigidity like Tim was talking about. This is the classic we're showing right now. Um, really thick um, back assembly of frame. So it really holds, like Tim mentioned, the shape. There's not gonna, you're not gonna get much flex. Metal does flex, believe it or not. But then look over here, it's almost half as thick. Um, and uh, so what happens is when you start tightening things down, adding plates, putting um, you know, things back together, you tighten on one side, it literally can bend and um, by, by, you know, minute um, adjustments, but enough to cause issues with, um, with Braille. And so you've got to be careful. Um, it's a lot of finesse with light touch Braillers when putting them back together. Um, you'll think like, well, when the plates are off, everything's working fine. But then when I put it back together, the Braille is an issue. So um, you can see lots cut away. Um, one thing too, um, and I believe you can, yeah. On the light touches, you're allowed to get, you can get to these bottom back assembly uh, nuts. And that's another thing we're gonna talk about is putting that um, packing grease um, in there. The light touches, these can come out and get removed. So 
like I said, if you hear something drop on the table or try to give yourself a workspace where if things fall out, you can kind of catch it. On the classic brailers, these can't be removed unless you take the whole uh, right plate off and then remove, um, remove it from the back assembly to get to um, these sides. So they're literally, once they're on, they're on. Um, so they do make it difficult if you have an issue, you gotta really take the brailler um, down quite a bit to get to it. So um, anything else I'm missing? Color is one. Oh, another thing on, and I mentioned before, what makes it a light touch? If I flip the, um, the Braille writer upside down, the keys are still facing me. Um, the metal that the keys um, give them their flex is quite a bit thinner. I don't know if, um, if it's showing up here, but it's, it has like a tongue that rests on the front assembly. So when you push down, um, it, it, you don't have to give as much force, where as the classic Brailler, um, they're much more rigid and um, you've got to you know, give it a little more oomph. You can, um, if you're finding um, a possible you know, one fixes, if your kids have an issues with um, the keys just can't enough on a classic Braille and you don't want to get a light touch, you can um, kind of depress the keys and flex those a little bit, but it, it, I, I would advise not to because you can, I've actually pushed too hard and, and um, they can break right here at the uh, rivet point, which means you have to buy a whole new key um, as well. So um, am I missing anything else, Tim? No, I think that's uh, good. I'm glad you brought up students because I was thinking the exact same thing right now with um, maybe a student who has a more of the classic brailler and older brailler. They sit there and especially like an older high school student math time, we've walked in the classrooms and everybody here is probably knows they're like, could you, could you, could you, and just like violently hitting these keys. While if a kid isn't informed, and told, hey, this is a different kind of brailler. Um, you don't have to hit the keys as hard. Um, I know it's hard to break habits because if they do that same exact motion on the light touch, we've gotten plenty of brailers in our shop, both Asian City and at FSDB, to where we've come in and, Carl, if you can point to the link pins on either side, because we've seen them both pop off, there's very small uh, pins that actually hold all these keys together. And so that really little pin right there um, that one, that thing will just, if that, those keys are crunched too hard, that thing will just pop. And then that way it is no longer connected to those big long rods that the carriage runs over that we focused on our cleaning last week. And that braille dot will cease to exist. Now there are many other factors to where um, a braille dot can disappear like that. This is just one of them. And like we said, all these systems are connected. So I'm still on the light touch right now. You literally can see the metal is a light silver. It's a thinner gauge. And I believe um, that I'm at the classic now. These are the parts that connect little pieces of thin metal that connect the keys and space bar. Um, and uh, on the classic, it's much thicker gauge. And I think it's dark because they actually might even uh, temper it a little bit to give it more um, rigidity in the process. But I, I could be wrong on that. So um, if there's no other questions about comparing the two brailers, I'm going to um, put one of them away and I'll bring out the, um, the one-handed brailler if you have any kids with, uh, let's say motor issues, um, amputees potentially, or students with uh, possible CP or um, that kind of things where their mobility or their uh, fine mobility motor skills are, might be limited. So I'm gonna put this away. Give me, forgive the shaky camera. And as Carl's going uh, to grab that, um, uh, unibrailers, they all function the same. Uh, they all go through, all the parts are the same, minus um, what you'll see right in front of you now is that little plate. And so it's actually, it looks scary, um, but it's literally one little mechanism, and it's like a little slide mechanism and the locking mechanism. So when you see Carl slap a key down, it's, he's going to go and that key's going to lock. And that's going to allow side. for whatever, ahead, um, for whatever um, that student is trying to braille. And so to take to, it's a little harder to disassemble because that little um, lever that's in the middle of your screen now about between keys one and two, that little lever you have to like manipulate the front plate over while depressing keys. I think that's what Carl's about to get at right now. Right, so normally when you see it um, put on, hang on a second. It's hard to do this with one hand actually. I'm sorry, Carl, I'm not there. You don't have to call me out in front of everybody. 
<laughs> okay, let's try that now. Come on. There we go. Normally, it looks like this. The only indication that you're going to know this is a one-handed brailler is that slide um, that um, Tim was talking about, okay? And what that does, you can see it, is you're allowed to depress one keys one, two, and three in any combination thereof. And then you can um, press any keys on uh, four, five, and six or the space bar to advance and the keys will move up after that. So um, you can press one, advance. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at the screen. I'm like, wait a second. One advance, one and two, one, three, um, any combination thereof. So getting it off is like you said, I depress one, two, three, and then I have to do the line space, kind of bend it back towards me and give it a shimmy and it pops off. So, um, so basically oh, what you're going to easily easier than it is. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there are three, um, screws that actually are the same screws that go, I'm sorry, I'm talking about the one handed brailler, this plate that covers, um, keys one, two, and three, um, in front and it's attached to the front assembly. Um, there are three screw, screws that are the same as the uh, bottom plate screws. Um, those need to be removed. And then they have a, uh, a flathead, very wide flathead, um, screw that, um, actually acts as a, um, like a pin, um, that the, the cam goes over and when, and there's a link, um, another link rod that connects the space bar to this cam. So when you push down on the space bar, it then releases the keys to move up. So, and you can see there are other little locking legs that ingeniously catch the keys. So when you press the space bar, they're then released. So the, what I, the point is, I want you to understand the function because the first time I got into one of these is what the heck and how do I clean this thing? It's essentially the same cleaning as we talked about before. You can drench this thing, you're not gonna hurt anything. The issue here is you can see even some grime starting to build up there. And this is a, um, we clean this brailler and it's ready to ship out. So all I did was take the plates off. So it still gets in there. Um, just try to remove as much as possible. Like I said, you can take these off, but I would um, take photographs and, um, <laughs> and video if you have to, so you can figure out where you started and, and go back. So um, this is not in the manual. Um, I don't believe so. I haven't seen it, um, but it's a pretty ingenious little, um, you know, probably a $5 uh, piece of metal um, to make it one handed. So any questions about um, the differences there? And you can see this is a newer model. They've actually um, cut out what some of the designs they've done on the um, light touch, they've also done on the front assembly. And yep, and the back assembly as well. It's um, not as skinny as the light touch, but um, definitely um, a lot, the back assembly is um, a lot thinner than the uh, classic. So I'm gonna go put this away and switch views. Okay. Uh, clear some space, so forgive me. Tim, if you want to talk about, um, we're going to go into the apron demo next, I believe. So um, we talked about this, obviously, when we we're taking the brailler apart, putting it back together. Um, and one of the things that I always like to reiterate whenever we are teaching this to somebody or teaching these workshops is that none of those screws should be forced, and especially this apron screw. Um, it's the biggest screw, so it is one of the easiest ones to work with. And as we kind of found out our first workshop that if you don't have that um, long shank to that eight inch big Phillips screwdriver, it makes that job a lot harder. And so what we, what we want to focus on for when we're putting that apron on is in the manual, it actually tells you to leave one apron screw and washer on the apron itself. I find it a little bit more difficult myself. I always take both of them all the way out. But when for this and what Carl's showing you now, is what he talks about is that gets dirty and what can really mess with the threads of your screws. So if you're going through and it starts and you realize you still about have half a screw length and it's getting really tight, you um, before you go any further and before you could possibly strip the threads or strip the head of the screw, take that screw out and clean the hole um, uh, that you're trying to put that screw into 
So Carl's got a great example of that on the screen right now. And right. then also cre clean that screw. Because what will happen is it's not the, it's not the hardest metal, um, these screws or that apron. And so if you really try and power through there and force a screw into there, you have the potential to not only wreck the 15 cent screw, but <laughs> the like $20 apron. Yeah, I think it's closer to $36. Um, yeah, so what I do is I inspect um, the, the actual threads in the apron itself. And you can actually see, I don't know if it's picking up, but there is a tiny um, little piece of metal in there. So we want to get that out. Um, and then I'm going to examine, I don't know if you guys can see the screw here. You can see there's debris on there, discoloration, even some oxidation closer to the washer or the head of the screw as well. So I'm going to switch cameras and um, I'll show you how I get in there, you know, with just about anything, a, a Q-tip of any kind um, to what, rinse all this stuff out with alcohol. And, um, and then we'll go, I'll put the front plate on and then I'll show you how to um, put that apron on and um, we'll go from there. And another thing that Carl reminded me of this too, looking at that screw up close and how dirty that was. Th there are plenty of times where we've sat down to take Braille writers apart and we literally have one of those little fun ice cream jars that we have laying around the shop. But we have that about maybe a quarter of the way full with just pure alcohol. And as we're taking the parts and in, the more you take apart a Braille, you get more comfortable with where everything goes. We literally will just dump all those parts into that solution into that alcohol into solvent if you have it whatever you're using to clean but even with that just sitting there and if you have a container that you can close that's resealable let those parts sit overnight because you'd be surprised even without scrubbing those metals sitting in that alcohol overnight it does a number um, in a good way to clean everything that you don't want to sit there with like your little toothbrush and scrub all these really tiny parts. And so it's really beneficial, as we stated last week, to have that good alcohol, again, 90 or above, 99.9 uh, .9 if you can get it. Um, and now what you see Carl's doing here is taking one of those long stem Q-tips that we, that we use. And um, again, he's getting alcohol ready and he's gonna take that Q-tip and he's gonna go through and he's gonna clean those apron holes. And this can be really beneficial because this, even these little Q-tips, I mean, we use these ones. You can use regular ear ones as well. Um, the, but these, this will take out those little burrs that we talked about that really we think are minute and wouldn't hinder a screw from going in there. But in actual reality, it can cause, I mean, you can cause a Braille to not have an apron anymore. You don't have to order a whole new one, like I said before. And so Carl's going both sides here cleaning out with a q-tip he's also you can the see -tip over um i don't know if you guys can see the dark residue on there and then, yeah so right now carl he's only he's gone like twice in either side and it's they're just filthy now be aware because carl just did one thing he snapped the q-tip but at least it snapped higher because we've had him before where we've like sat there and picked at an apron hole for 20 minutes with the tweezers because we've snapped the q-tip in the apron hole and that's not fun and Carl's smirking because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And so it's all, all those little nuances and everything else that um, just help the brailler continue to function, Carl. Yeah, so, um, so I've cleaned, I've flushed it with alcohol. I'm gonna do the same. Um, you can use a rag or, um, and I just get a little section of the rag um, wet, wet with alcohol and then go through and just kind of rub those threads um in there you can even use um those brushes we were talking about and run your um your brush through there it doesn't have to be perfect but you just and essentially um the alcohol not only um you know cleans things but it also if it's okay to have residue on there because i think it kind of makes it uh, go in a little smoother too so and forgive me do this last one Okay, so you're going to put the washers on the um, on your large uh, screws, and I'm going to I turn the brailler so one side of it, it really doesn't matter is close to me. Um, and remember, your front plate has to be in first if you're putting the apron on. 
And so you're going to take a corner. It doesn't matter if it's left or right. Um, and you're going to put, remember that groove that's down in here? You're going to take that groove and stick it on the closest tooth that's on the, remember we talked about the bottom of the front, front plate, kind of like they kind of um, move side to side like saw teeth and get that one in and then you're just going to give it a good wrap and you can hear it lock in. Sometimes they're really stiff on older brailers. Um, this one seems to be pretty good. Sometimes you can even get a little play. You can see me moving the apron while it's still in the track left and right or on your screen, I guess, uh, forward and, and up and down, I guess. Um, let me rephrase. On the plane, it, the groove is on the teeth. We're moving it side to side. And what I'm looking for is um, my eye is along the back assembly and I'm looking for the hole in the apron, which we just cleaned out and making sure it's lined up and the, you'll feel um, where those line up there on the actual um, plate, the right and left plate of the actual casting, there's like a little um, U shape where you want that space to line up. And then I'm gonna come in and I can, if this helps, you can see over here, I've got the back of the brailler towards me with the front um, away from me and it's upside down. I'm gonna take my long um, uh, Phillips screwdriver it's a good idea that if, if you don't have one um, to get a magnetizer on this one. So you can buy these for a couple of bucks. Actually, does that have the price on here? No, it doesn't. Sorry. Um, and you run it through the magnet a couple of times. It magnetizes it. And what it does is it allows you to hold that screw on a little better. And then I'm going to come using the back assembly as a guide, run down towards the front of the brailler and align both of those um, areas. And you can manipulate the apron. Sometimes it'll pop off and you just have to restart. Um, and light pressure at first while I'm turning because I, want, I don't want to strip those screws and I want to make sure it gets in as straight as possible. Because remember, even though I'm using this as a guide, my um, screwdriver still pitched at a, a couple degrees. So we don't want, we want to make sure kind of fighting against that um, straight line. So I've turned till it stops and then you turn just a little quarter turn. No more, okay? Doesn't have to be that tight. Actually, when I put the first one in, I leave it a little loose because sometimes you've got to manipulate the right side. So you can see, as long as the, this apron doesn't come off, um, it's still gonna stay on the track. My screw and washer are still intact. So I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side. Coming in from the back here, going down, slightly turning. Um, sometimes I'll even push down closer to the, um, that a little better, closer to the, um, the screw, really light and making sure it's going in. And that alcohol really helps because it's going in like butter. And this um, is also so, the side to where Carl's coming over the top for both sides, but that little hole where his right hand w just was, he can, you can actually feed the screwdriver through the back correct. assembly and get a more straight hand shot. Now, okay. why Perkins didn't do that in the design for both sides? The world may never know. But well, I think you've got the line space which kind of interferes with that. Right. Side, but, and so you um, go through. And so at least um, my preference is I at least when I can get that right side, feed the screwdriver yeah. through the back assembly to just get a better lineup for that. And so I would just come from the back because not every brother is that way. It's just out of habit. Either it's your preference, whatever, whatever you do to get the job done safely. And uh, so again, both are loose here. Now what I'm going to do is I center the brailler in front of me. It's still upside down and I can still manipulate and you hear that knocking. Um, I want to move it so it's centered. And so I just through feel, um, you can kind of close your eyes, get an idea of I've run my fingers along the um, outside edge side plates towards the front of the brailler. And when it comes in contact with the apron and I just kind of make sure I've got equidistance on both sides. Once I have that, I tighten down on one side and I've hit resistance and I turn a little more just a quarter little turn. And then I go back to the other side and do the same thing. And you, if you go slow enough in your fingers there, um, you can feel it starting to tighten up. It doesn't need, you don't need to wrench down. Remember there are one, two, three more plates that go onto this thing. Um, so all of those do tighten down on this. The apron just kind of acts as a, um, a counter support to the actual um, back assembly. So it's not on that tight and I'll flip it back over. And you can see it all put back together. 
Does that help? Again, we're recording this too, so um, it can give you a little bit of a, um, a reference at a later date, if that's helpful. Sound good, Tim? Yep, no questions so far in the chat. Okay, we did Classic Pro's apron, stick wax. All right, so um, we mentioned on the back here, or any, pretty much all the, the nuts on, on the actual um, uh, insides of the right and left plate, there are housings or castings in the plate that hold um, nuts. And there are big ones and small ones. Um, most of them, with the exceptions of, I usually don't put any stick wax, try not to, on the, um, the ones that go on the, the uh, front plate. Because that grime can, you know, if it gets hot or in Florida, there's a lot of humidity. And so over time that can kind of drop down onto the chain and different things like that. And so um, if it doesn't need it, I, I usually don't put it in. But with the other ones, um, oh, we've got uh, on the top plate, there's three screws. On the back, there's uh, four. So how that's done, and we talked about where we can get the stick wax uh, from Amazon. It's just one more reference, Castorol stick wax. Um, we use a, a pen cap, it gets pretty grody. Um, and it's just a good applicator. You can use the screwdriver for that matter, whatever you need. Um, I usually take a small Allen wrench or a small, you can use um, a toothpick for that matter. And you go in and I run it through the actual hole of the nut and pull out. I'm gonna do it on the other side so you guys can get a better vantage point. You can see on the tops here, I've put remove those. So you can feel with your fingers, a pretty decent cavity, parts of the fat of your finger can kind of get in there. And so by taking um, some of the stick wax, it's very, I don't know if you can tell. I mean, I'm putting on my fingers and it, it's pretty sticky stuff. Um, it's like almost the same consistency, a little thicker than Vaseline, if that um, helps. And you just take a little bead, really not that much. You kind of force it in there and pack it all the way to the back. And then I come in with my finger or a rag and make sure there's no um, oozing out of the actual um, uh, housing there. And I'll come over and do the same on this side. Again, forcing some in there, wiping it down. Use a rag to clean your hands. And then I can come in by hand and push it in, um, a pair of tweezers, whatever um, works for you. Um, shoot a magnet for that matter. And then you're going to come in and just slide it. It doesn't matter which direction it is. You can see this one actually has a little bit of residue on there. So if I were you, I'd clean this. But for our purposes today, and you can see it really um, starts to bind with the, um, the actual uh, nut. And you just force it in there and push, push, push till it's flush. Some usually squeezes out on the top or bottom, just kind of wipe it off. Same thing on the other side, push. And then what that does is it holds them in there. So when you flip and manipulate the brailler, um, I can shake this and they're not gonna come falling out. When you start putting the brailler on the side or you know, you're really getting in there cleaning, um, sometimes the solvents can, um, or over time, eat away at that stick wax and they just fall out. And it's more of a nuisance than anything. But it also helps when you put the plates on, you know those screws are going to stay there. Now, a little tip. When you put this top plate back on, or any of the plates, and now you put the stick wax in, um, let me switch cameras real quick. I think what Carl's about to get to, correct me if I'm wrong, Carl, is about lining up the nuts now. Yeah. So, so when I come in, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. So now you see that those nuts aren't going to be lined up. So what can be frustrating, especially if you're trying to go fast and put things together, if Carl puts that top plate screw in, it's not going to go in because now it's not going to be lined up anymore. And, and so this happens, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So uh, when we've done workshops in the past, what causes people to strip screws and strip nuts and, you know, cause headache is they're just, grinding away, grinding away, spinning that screw over and over and over again on there. So what we do is I take a little Allen wrench, again, a toothpick works, anything, and just feed it in there. And you kind of want to go around the circle and line it up so you can see it's much more aligned. Even the little stick wax is in there, not a big deal. I can go to the front, do the same thing. And you can see, um, my finger gets out of the way. I can move this left and right, okay? The and stick much, wax is heavy duty enough to where the, the one of the more frustrating places if you do put stick wax on all of these nuts is the back plate 
because you're thinking everything's going to line up and you're putting the back plate screws in and they um, will stay in place until you move them. And so this is a great little tool. Um, it do, and it doesn't really, it has a high, I mean, we always talk about Florida, how hot we are, but I've never opened a brailer up and been like, oh, the stick wax is everywhere. So yes, less is more, but you still can put enough in there to make sure that nut is going to stay in place. So, um, Tim, can you explain, I don't have one on my hand. Yes, I do. Okay. No, uh, no, no. What yes, am I explaining? Do. Nothing. I'm going to switch cameras real quick. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to grab a brailler real quick, just so you can see. So the next question that we're going to talk about, I have a brailler upside down with the apron in front of it facing me. Um, we mentioned there are 11 screws that go in there. You can also see the feet. Um, and so this one's really old. They're starting to wear down for sure. But just beyond the feet, in between, um, if you can feel the back of the brailler, if, if it's upside down, you feel the back of the brailler, you'll find the feet on the sides. And then there's a bigger hole that goes, um, that goes through the bottom plate. And I will explain what that attaches to, okay? But essentially, with the kit, somebody asked, what are the holes for? And so with the kit, um, there's a, Perkins a sells a, kit. excuse me, with a repair kit. Um, they sell a um, pressure tension screwdriver and it's got uh, two little teeth with a collar on the shaft. It's called a BSP-1 is the actual um, part if you ever need a replacement. But it goes down in the hole and there is a special um, threaded collared nut that goes on um, these two posts one on each side respectively, that run to the beam of the brailler, which I'm pointing to to my right, um, which has the, beam the, is carriage, like the carriage head yep, runs, on. runs on side side to side. And what that does is it calibrates the distance from the, the head to the top of the stylus because you can't, have, you can't have too much pressure or too little pressure because those needles or the pins coming through the bottom of the stripper plate, um, they, they only go so far. So... Um, so you're adjusting that beam, and the only thing you can adjust is the the pressure on the beam and the actual head itself. So they go in there, and you make quarter turns. Um, older ones, sometimes the, the threads kind of wear, and it's hard to feel, but you can watch or feel um, muscle memory, feel how, how you're turning it. So this is where you can go in, but you can also adjust it when the brailler is not, um, does not have the plates on. So let me go put this back. And, and I'll this show would be you the, the second instance of um, why you would not have a brailler dot. So earlier we were talking about if maybe one of those uh, key pins um, popped out and the key is no longer working, or here in this case would be if that pressure is off and that beam, if one of those nuts that um, Carl's about to show you comes loose or comes off that post, the braille on that side um, will start to lack. And so it can happen to where if maybe you have experience you're brailing on a machine and you get to the center and then those dots just start to fade and that could be because there is an inconsistency in the post tension on these screws and everything that carl's about to show you now yep so um to give you perspective the brailler is on its left side um the back assembly is facing um the camera and um what i have the brailler in is called a cradle it's a wooden uh, piece that comes with the actual repair kit it's got a, a large, two uh, even side blocks. One is bigger in width with a groove that the um, corner of the brailler fits in and then it rests and it gives clearance so the knob doesn't hit the ground, okay? Um, what I wanna show and explain before I switch cameras again is you can see I'm facing the back of the um, stylus right now and there you can see the springs of the pins underneath and the stripper plate and it moves up and down and then the actual embossing head. And I don't know if you can see the indentations of the six holes, which actually produce um, the cone shaped braille dots we all know and love. And so if you follow along, as I go up the brailler or up the left side, you can see the edge of the um, track or the, the beam that it runs on. And then through here is, um, hang on, there we go the post that connects the beam and runs all the way down to the bottom of the brailler on the other side where I showed you that hole. So now we have the bottom plate removed 
and it's next to the foot. And this is what we're going to be um, inserting the BST1, is that right? Yeah. BST1 in there. And um, I don't, and let me show you the tool itself. You can see the tool um, has two teeth with a hollowed out um, shaft and then a collar that slips on there as well. Okay. And so we insert that tool in here. And what I'm looking for is as I adjust the, um, I have to, it, you can feel it seed in there, but as you adjust it, you're literally, um, for lack of a better term, squeezing the, the distance between the nut down here and the bottom of the beam. And it squeezes, which then in turn puts, changes the distance of the actual stylus head. And that determines, um, you know, if you get braille dots that are popping through, this might be one of the many fixes that adjust this as well. We'll show you one other. Um, and it also, um, they can pop through, they can mash down too much, they can um, be too faint or not non-existent at all. So um, one thing in the toolkit, the repair kit, excuse me, is they give you a, um, uh, basically a small um, chunk of metal attached to a small little um, metal rod and it has a ring on the end so you can kind of insert your finger. But this is a guide. This kind of gives you a gauge as to um, the distance. If I come in there. The distance of what the tension should be. So it shouldn't be too much pressure. I'm pulling it out with one finger and you can see the stripper plate and um, pushing back in and I can push it in with one finger as well. So that's how you adjust um, some of the Braille dots. There are a couple other um, repairs that we would do. And again, we'd make quarter turns with this, just kind of one to the right and you can feel it. I'm gonna go back because I know this Braille is working and I don't wanna mess up with the Braille. So that's one um, repair and what those holes are on the bottom of the Brailler. And so uh, Carl, someone did ask the question, I did answer it in the chat as well. And just in case nobody um, had the chance to see it, they asked, well, what happens if you press the keys down and no braille is being produced? And I kind of answered it. It can be, it's the classic like dirt and grime in that area of the brailler. But when you have to, when you start talking about the actual production of braille and the, uh, the assemblies of what we keep saying, like the beam and the stylus and the carriage housing and everything else, there's, it's very hard to pinpoint without actually like having a brother like that in front of me or in front of Carl, because it could be extra dirt, but it could be extra dirt to inside that housing or the stylus are that we would have to take off that back plate. And once you take off that small, tiny back plate, everything in there is spring loaded. So it kind of pops out at you and you have all six stylus that come out with five different minute flat washers. And then you have other springs that create the plate and everything um, that create that tension that Carl was just showing you that we use for that gauge. And so to di diagnose that problem, that's a really tough one to kind of do here in this type of setting. Um, but those would just be the things that I can think of off the top of my head. And just because that is probably one of the more intricate parts of the entire machine, um, when Braille is not being produced, it that one takes a little longer to try and figure out how um, we would like want to proceed or the shape of the, how, the shape of the machine was in when we received it. So we're going to move on to the other repair, which is um, also impacts the, um, the Braille. And so we mentioned the pressure on the beam. The next is, is the distance on the keys, as well as how level the cams are on the back assembly. So if you see, I don't know, let me see if I can come in here. I I'll press one you. of the keys. Carl, I'm sorry? I don't want to interrupt you, but you did ask me to give you a time at 445. So it is officially 445. Doing great. Thank you so much. So when you depress one of the keys, you can see the cam starts to raise. Okay, I'm pressing the number four key, which is the cam closest to the internal parts of the parallel. Um, what happens is we want them to be nice and flat level. Actually, if I can get my finger in there, um, level with the actual surface, um, of the back assembly. So what happens is you look down there, sometimes there's grime in there, which we need to clean, but sometimes these cams will be all kinds of unlevel and things like that. So how do we change that? There are two ways 
that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you up close where I'm going to be working, and then I'll pan back to the main um, uh, <laughs> the main camera. So you'll see there in the at the tops of each one of the keys there are cams that are linked to the front assembly. So there are front cams, and I mentioned back cams over the top here, okay? So they're connected to the assembly with a, um, an Allen wrench. So the bigger, I don't know which side, I guess it'd be one, one quarter maybe, or three, I don't know. It's the larger Allen wrench, and there are six of them, for one for each key. And so they um, set the cams that you can, push forward into the assembly or pull back. That's one way of adjusting the braille, but there's another two. When we flip the braille upside down, the actual distance of the keys, if we loosen, if we're underneath the underneath side of the braille, if we loosen these um, um, screws here, they would then in turn cause the key to um, move towards the back of the braille or we can move towards the front. Generally, you want them in line there. You can see there's um, a casting underneath um, or depending on your perspective, we're underneath, we're looking underneath. So underneath the, the key or above the key is a casting that it rests on. We kind of want that edge of the metal part of the front of the key in line with each one of those. But you can make minor adjustments if you're having like a dot one or two, as long as the link pin is not missing these links between the key and the back assembly aren't missing, you can make small adjustments by loosening this nut here or loosening this um, screw here and moving it forward or back along with the um, Allen wrench set screws on the front cams. I'm gonna switch camera and I'm gonna show you how I do the repair um, again. And then you can, obviously this will be recorded um, and we'll, I'll answer any questions. So I'm going through here. Um, we are fortunate enough to have access to um, a big old um, slag of steel or a big piece of steel. Because as Carl said before, um, you want those cams as flat as possible. And we've seen machines and done different things. Um, and before we use the steel that Carl was just showing, we use a Jenga block. And that's exactly Hopefully what it is. Hopefully it's not uh, infringement not, or anything. But this is uh, not sponsored by Jenga. If I say that, <laughs> we're fine legally. Um, and so as Carl's going to do the repair the first time, or it's the same for both, but traditionally yeah. before we got that steel, because we've only had it for the shot for a little over a year, Carl's first going to go through, doesn't matter the order, left to right, right to left, in and out. Um, but he's going to take the larger Allen wrench and he's going to loosen and not take out, but loosen all yep. of those... Um, hex uh, screws that attach those key cams to the housing. And the reason we say don't take them out is because they are about the size of a pin. So yeah. if you're not in a setting to where you're gonna drop those somewhere, you'll never find it again. We, we fortunately enough in the shop have like a magnetic broom. And so when we lose these smaller pieces, we can get that magnetic broom out and we just push that around the floor and you can hear all of our parts that we've dropped over the last couple of weeks. Like, ding, 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 ding. I'll yep. pick them up and we're like, oh, we found them. <laughs> so we mentioned the braille or the, the beam, adjust the braille. That's one way. That pressure on the beam is very important that when you get the repair kit um, and the manual, you can read through that and we'll show you how to do that. Um, or they give you this small two Allen keys or Allen wrenches, one, the larger one we're using, but well, you can also buy um, these that have the uh, you know, mechanic ones, the same size. So it's just easier to go in, push down, and they're in pretty good. Um, and I just do kind of get one turn and then a full turn just to make sure they're cleared. And again, with the cleaning, you can get in there if you're finding that, so I'll explain these cams that go into the front assembly, they should move smoothly. So if you manipulate and push them, I don't know if you can see, my fingers are moving away from the assembly and towards, away from the assembly and towards. When I push on the keys, um, the cams are moving and they should come back to rest when the keys are um, resting and up. And when I show you the back, now that I have the keys loosened, or the, the cams loosened, excuse me, you can see the back cams do not engage. They don't go up, okay? So we just wrap a tap tap a couple times on here until it's nice and um, rested. A jingle block, a small piece of 
wood, maybe three quarters. Um, you can go find your kid's Jenga block. Um, and then what I do is I rest that on there. And again, I put it at an angle. So I make sure I'm using the back of the assembly as a guide, because if I have it kicked out on the, excuse me, let me rephrase, the inside of the back assembly, I have it resting on there, which is nice and smooth, and you'll feel that it's level with the cams. If I have it on the back side of the back assembly, you can see I can uh, mess with the track. I could even get it way up on some of these screws, and that definitely would not present a level surface. So I want to get it level, and I just hold down with my, my thumb. If I have the slug of metal, I rest it on there, same thing. I don't need, I have an extra hand free, so that's why we got that. So make friends with a, uh, um, a metal uh, shop and they'll help you out. And then I just wrap a tap the keys again, um, move the head over a little bit, just be careful. Uh, I make a mistake, I throw this back and then now I'm jamming that up against there. So I just want it to ride along with the same assembly as it normally does. That's just my way of doing it. You don't have to do this. You can just press one and, and twice and we're good. While still holding on the Jenga block, I'm coming with my other hand and my Allen wrench, hence why we've got the, the T Allen wrench because it just makes it easier. And I know now that all these keys are reset because they're attached with the link pin underneath. And so I'm tightening them, not too tight, just till it stops. And then there's enough flex in this rod that we make another little quarter turn and that's enough. And so I'm and, going back through. Uh, one thing to do and always remember, because I do it all the time, is um, for the purpose of this workshop, we have the brailler trim to the side so everyone is able to see the backside. Traditionally, and I also have long monkey arms. And so I will sit here and have the keys facing me and reach over the top of my, my brailler and do this. Well, I'll close the whole thing up, but then I'll start there and start typing and start trying to throw the carriage around. Well, guess what? Tim forgot to take the big three pound thing of steel off the back of his yep. brailler and you're like what's going on and you're like oh because <laughs> and maybe in your case it'll be well there's a jenga block in my brailler that i just put block. there yeah so you can see the keys are um flat flat as i can get them using a jenga block and then when i depress the keys they begin to engage uh, hopefully you guys can see that on the camera okay so that's one one thing that can impact your um, braille dots and then i mentioned the keys underneath i can make small adjustments by um, loosening that key, or excuse me, loosening, um, yeah, well, the attachment of the key. I'm just going to take a screwdriver. I can use the big one or a small one, doesn't matter. The farther away you get from a screw, the more torque you have on something. So sometimes these can be a little tough. Um, I, you know, my first bet is to adjust like we did before with the Allen wrench. If I've got to make other adjustments, um, you do it here. I just be careful because once you mess with this, you might be going back and forth and playing with things. I'm just letting you know that all of these things play into the system of, of the Braille. So um, before, you know, you, you've got to get a Braille or back out to somebody, um, you may want to work on one that um, you can spend some time on in, in practice um, when doing and, it. And with that being said, when we are doing um, this repair, um, traditionally it's when we're, the Braille's impacted we will take all those keys actually out of the brailler uh, for two reasons. One, um, because we like to take them out and the first main one is clean them. The only way you can really get good and grime to where all those um, rollers ride that are in the front cams of this machine is to take those keys out. And so we would undo all those, those yep. uh, six screws that Carl has the brailler facing to the sky right now, take so those can... out. We loosen everything out over the top and, um, that allows you to disengage all those cams and take everything apart. If you loosen the uh, front cams with the Allen wrench and the screw here, you can see this key is really loose, but you would be able to pull this key completely out. I don't want to do that right now, um, but you can. And um, you just put it back in the assembly in there. There's a bearing on the inside of the cam that runs inside the center of the screw or center of the key. And, um, and that's what it rides along and adjust that. So, you then can, you know, move this key forward or back and you can see how it engages that link pin, which is then pulling on the actual um, um, cam itself. So any movement I do to that, it's adjusting the cam down here. Um, also, just another tip, these um, link rods with the link pins we talked about, sometimes they pop off. Um, 
they're sharp and they're all different sizes. You have to know the order um, and it's very complex. So I wouldn't just go popping these off um, doing that. I would make sure you read through the manual multiple times and feel comfortable um, taking one off a time, putting it together. When I first started, that's how I did it. Um, so um, you shouldn't see a Breller with multiple links. Usually there's one link pin off, but um, so that's um, the two or three methods that um, impact the actual Braille. If that's what's and also with that being said, if you do feel confident enough and you take the, cause it is possible to take the keys out without taking those links out. If you take the keys out, those are interchangeable. So um, that's one of the few parts in the brailler that you could take all six of them out, throw them in a, like a bucket, a bin of alcohol, really scrub them, do what you need to do, and then go back in any order. It will not matter. Yep. Oh. Actually, since I've been messing with this, I put the other one. Oh, this is our actual brailler. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so that's cam and key adjustments. Okay. And we're up to our last, um, our last section which is the chain. Um, oftentimes when you're brailing along, you should feel a cadence where if you can see down there, um, the chain is attached to the embossing head. Nice moving, should catch. It shouldn't go ping all the way to one side or the other. That could be a more catastrophic issue, um, which involves the rack bar, which is underneath with the, the, um, the teeth there. Um, or it could also be the pressure on the beam which we, you can make some adjustments, but just be careful. When it usually gets to that, there's some indication that this braille has probably been dropped or something has gone completely loose or failed. Um, so you may want to send it off to a, te a technician if I was advising somebody um, from afar. Um, so you're moving along. And when the, the embossing braille head gets all the way to the right, you can see this chain is resting. I'm going to switch cameras here to give you a better view. Um, it's resting on the front assembly itself. So you can see there's no play, okay? What we want is a, just enough slack so that the chain is resting above. And I'm gonna actually show you on the light touch because you can actually see. So what I'm talking about is this assembly on the other brailler, we can't see that from the front. You kind of have to feel engaged. So, but on the light touch, if we bring that embossing head over, you can see there's play. I would argue this one probably is a little tight. Um, you literally just want it, it, you just don't want it to touch, okay? That's one way. Now, what can happen over time, you may need to tighten this more and that's what may have happened because light touches are notorious for, um, the frame sometimes can be difficult to put back together and that all changes the distance or the specs where things connect which then in turn can impact the chain. This chain can get old and stretched out. So if you've got a brailler that hasn't been serviced or one that's over 50 years, you probably need a new chain. Um, and so we want that to be just above that. And how we adjust that is over here on the left. There's a, a large um, screw with a washer. I, Tim, don't quote, can you help me on this? I don't know if it's the same one. I don't think it is. It's not the same size as the apron screw. I think it's a little different. It is not the same um, as the apron screw. Yeah. So it's a different screw. Um, and what it does is connects to a, um, lack of a better term, a pulley or a wheel. Um, and so if I were to loosen that, sorry, I'm one hand in it here. If I loosen that and I don't take it out of the way, you can see there's a lot more wiggle room here. But as I push on the wheel away from the center of the brailler or so towards the left side, you can see I'm making adjustments on the chain. It's literally rising up as I make it tighter or lower. If anybody's ever replaced a chain on their bike, it's the same kind of thing as adjusting that back wheel um, closer or away from the actual distance of the chain. This can be tricky. If you find yourself where it's just not working out, the screw when you're tightening this um, keeps spinning or it doesn't stay put, you're gonna need either a new screw is stripped or an actual wheel itself, um, the threads inside the wheel can begin to wear as well, or you just made a need a new chain as well. So I'm gonna switch um, camera angles here and um, so you can see me make that repair. I'm answering a question right now. Um, somebody did ask if the 
brailler works fine but the chain is rubbing on the assembly um i this is one of our main checks that we do when we make repairs and we're doing cleanings um obviously it's always i mean you get the classic adage if it ain't broke don't fix it but with this machine and with these parts even if it's a light touch if it's an if it's an old one 60 years old a year old um metal is metal and so if that metal in the bottom of that chain is rubbing on the assembly it can start to maybe dull everything out and to where the chain it doesn't just run that same path you got to think it's also running through the wheel that carl adjusted and just showed it had shown there but it's also running that gear on the right because on the right side of the brailler that um gear is attached to your backspace and so if you have a bad chain that shows wear, it can start skipping gears um, the backspace could also start uh, stop slipping and and also could affect the mainspring because the mainspring is what holds the tension on that gear and that chain as well. And so that's a great example of what can kind of happen if one system goes, another three can as well. Right. And so Carl just put the snake cam up now and showing how he made that adjustment. So before, if we remember, that chain was sitting pretty high. And I agree, I was going to mention it, but Carl beat me to it when he was like, I would say it was too tight because I was about to say the same thing this chain tension here is probably as close as you're going to get because now if carl if you just give it like a quick flick like it's going to bounce but it's going to rest in kind of that down position because Mm -hmm. and that's what we want because if you have too much tension it's going to cause your carriage to have too much tension when it goes forward and back which then in turn underneath will get caught on the rack bar which in turn right and so when you're pushing down on the um the back space that's what's throwing the whole assembly to the left, okay? And if that chain is too tight or too loose, you're going to get skipping. You're going to get, um, um, it just won't work at all. Or by the time you get to the left or right, it'll just kind of go dead in the water. But you can see I'm able to in advance the embossing head all the way over. And then I go back and press the space bar, which causes the embossing head to go all the way to the right. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to show you something. Um, I have the camera right overhead of the um, the backspace side of the machine, so on the um, the right hand side, and I want you guys to watch. For those that can see, um, this is extremely hard to line up with outside um, sight. I'm still working on a um, uh, solve for that, but I haven't gotten there yet. So um, as we engage, you'll notice somebody punched a hole in the collar. Uh, you can see that it, on older brailers, it's a line. Um, and on newer brailers, it's a, they just take a, a, a punch, steel punch, and make a hole. That distance, that, that hole needs to be facing up when the embossing head is on this mark on the front assembly. On the, um, uh, about four inches from the right-hand side is a mark. On the old ones, let me see you can see a slight um, raise or even a um, indentation mark on the front assembly where the embossing head should line up on the new brailers is a, they actually put it into the frame. So it's very visible. So that distance is calculated out to certain number of links from the top of the backspace gear all the way along to that point. And you want it to get, where the, the chain connects with the embossing head about there to line up. And then you can make fine tune adjustments with these two screws um, on the left or right that are actually, you can feel, if you feel the chain there, um, it, you can feel the two screws that connect to like a, um, a tab of metal that attaches the chain to the actual embossing head. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, how we do this repair and we call this aligning the chain because what can happen is if your chain's too loose, it could slip and you may see the head over a half an inch lined up there, but the dot on the um, gear is way over to the right or way over to the left. It, it needs to be straight, in, straight up. And if it is straight up, the embossing head also needs to line up with that mark. So um, I'm gonna kind of <laughs> try to do this with one hand. So give me a second while Tim kind of talks. Um, and yeah, so um, this, this repair would be done or repair, really an adjustment. This adjustment's 
would be completed before you do the tension. Because if you do your, because after you do this whole adjustment and trying to get that chain timing and that length correct, you're actually creating a tighter chain. And so you'll go through and if you do your chain tension first and then go back to here, you might have to either, you're gonna have to loosen it no matter what because your chain will be too tight to make this adjustment or you already just re-loosened your chain. You're gonna have to tighten it back up again. And so a lot of times, and it's really nice that we do for this is that we will, that left side screw that you use to adjust that tension, loosen that up, let it hang there. So you can see I'm actually running into a difficulty here. And this is why it's very important. I advise you to get additional training. Um, I normally, these come out very easily. This left one you can see um, is, I was able to back it out quite a bit. The right one, I'm almost to the point of failure in stripping um, the screw head because it doesn't want to come out. So I'm going to switch to another brailler real quick and show you that um, same repair on the classic brailler. Hopefully this one will work. So And so what Carl's doing here um, with this adjustment, so this one can be done and he's removing and um, not fully removing, but taking out those two front screws. And that's going to be when there's a very minor adjustment that has to be made. So before Carl had, Carl had mentioned that sometimes you'll go and it'll be to like a half inch or an inch to the left of that or to the right of that mark. And that actually makes it to where we have to loosen everything up and actually do. And Carl's showing it right now, showing that a screwdriver kind of shoved into the machine. It holds because the... We we have the to depress. We have to depress the backspace, which in turn holds the gear with that dot vertical and up like we want it, and then we can finally move over to the carriage, and make those chain adjustments as needed. So I'm going to try to uh, loosen these real quick, and I'll show you the play, the small adjustments you can make on this, and hopefully, there we go. Woo! Get a little nervous. Um, you can see these are loose. And I can, with my thumb, move. It's, I mean, it's, I think the total distance that it's moved there is probably maybe a quarter inch, if that. It's not much, but it's enough to tighten the chain or cause the, the gear to move left or right when you got to make those. Once you get the alignment, you can make small adjustments here um, to make sure the head will travel from the right side all the way. To the left side and that's another thing if your chain is too loose it, there's no tension on that gear so when you hit that backspace lever if there's no tension wow. there's nothing to give that gear cause and reason to turn and so that's what um happens when that timing and that adjustment needs to be made same thing with the tension um, we opened brailers up before where that one of those screws has fully just come off that front plate of the carriage and what's happening is everything is kind of twisting and turning because of the tension being placed in one spot. And okay. so after this adjustment is made is when you still now gain back that new or that nice left and right, that cadence that Carl was talking about when the keys are pressed. But as we said before, you make this adjustment, you have to go back and check your tension. Okay. So we've officially covered the repairs we wanted to address. Um, in, in these sessions. Um, I wanted to go over, one of the things we also talked about were additional tools. I think we spent a little bit of time, but um, I just want to show you with the, if it's helpful, you think the snake cam, Tim, or the regular cam? Regular. Different tools. Okay, I'm gonna close this off. Um, and also we are, about half an we, hour. we are over about, we are over, we're at 5.11. So we okay. have about 20 minutes left. And so, right. I'll go um, fast. yeah, we're gonna do these tools. And then also, if you want to start asking questions, because we want to Perfect. Uh, make sure that, because our week four is kind of our open, our, it's our open day. It's our, we want to hear from you guys and we want to do what we can to help you out. And we want you guys to bring what you've seen to the table and any experience. Because here we want to make sure we teach you guys specific things. But on our week four, I want you, we want to encourage you guys to focus up, send those questions in to uh, FIMC. Um, that way we can get the juices flowing because we want to make sure that any problems cleaning, um, something that may be just a random question, we want to make sure that we can um, do that next week. Go for it, Carl. Okay, so 
put this bro on the side here. Um, you guys knew I showed you this screw is about to strip. What I'm probably going to do before um, I leave today is, is we sell these at a hardware store. They're called Speed Out. Um, they're pretty awesome. It's basically uh, a way to um, pull defect. You're going to ruin the screw, but you can get it out. Um, and so you would just put these into, um, they come in different sizes. Um, doesn't have to be this brand. They make all different kinds of um, actual um, extraction tools. Even uh, Hansen is another one. This is the first one I bought. Um, comes in all kinds of sizes with a actual drill, metal drill bit, and then um, a screw that, um, that actually grabs uh, the hole that you drilled in. So um, whatever you have to heat them out, or heat them out, I say heat because um, heat does help with some of the stuff. I have not taken a blowtorch um, to this. So um, if you, but if you're experienced with metal and all kinds of stuff, have at it. So um, another thing is a, uh, a drill. Why are you laughing at me? Um, <laughs> it's got, a, it's got a, a lot of kick to it. So we put this in and um, a you know, high we can, torque drill. Um, yeah. The reason I make sure to mention that is because if you use like a, just a household, like DeWalt, um, something that like you just get at Lowe's on sale, it's not going to have the torque in that drill that um, you're going to need to use a tool like a speed out. Yeah. Um, it's all, all you're going to do is going to strip the screw more and possibly damage your machine. Yep. So these come in handy, not the end all be all. Um, I probably, if I use a, a good screwdriver and bang it up on that, put some um, even oil in there, uh, you know, possibly some kind of other solvent, very small bit in there, um, that could work too. So a drill can come in handy. These speed outs or any kind of extraction tools are handy. Um, we use um, some of the other repairs. We use uh, punches for um, taking, um, there's a repair, someone mentioned the O-rings. When we remove one of the tabs, there's a, um, a metal fitting in there that you have to remove. And so the best way is to get yourself a set of punches. They just come in handy for rapid tapping on things. If sometimes if a screw, um, you know, needs to be, popped out or come in at a weird angle, sometimes you can, you can use that too. Um, I mentioned this earlier, the, the magnet, um, magnetizing, I would only do, yeah, probably the long, um, the long Phillips head was the first one I would magnetize. I'd stay away from the flathead and, um, and other ones, um, just cause it could start sticking to all kinds of things. Um, files. When you get into more serious repairs or a key, sometimes down in the grooves, there's just so much grime in there. Somebody mentioned, you know, residue, things like that. They make really um, small files. I found this at like an ace clearance section. They're cheapy as heck. Um, doesn't need to be anything big, even big ones too. Um, you get in there, something's warped. You got to file something down. But before you get to filing, and this is both Mr. Uh, Tim and I have um, made these mistakes. Um, make sure you're doing the repair correctly. You've read the manual. Um, things could be off because of your mistake and you've filed something down too far and you've ruined that part. So um, go very uh, cautiously and sparing. Um, Especially with the bigger files. With the bigger file, yeah. <laughs> small, small goes a long way. Um, hammers, we use everything from a, a rubber uh, mallet. We mentioned the nylon mallets are great. They don't really bang up too much and um, they're helpful. Um, and a ball, little ball peen hammer um, works as well um, for for different things. Um, so if you just get really frustrated and you just want to have at it, no, just kidding, don't do that. Um, we, I think you've been seeing on here. Um, types. One, I know one we haven't talked about yet is the long, long nosed needle nose, the big. I'm getting there. Well, I know I was trying to give you an intro. Oh, cool. Gotcha. So <laughs> you see these on here too. Um, let me move this out of the way. And so these, um, these long jawed needle nose, both the uh, forcep style with the 45 degree and the flat ones that Carl's has, um, we've used those for so many different, I, I couldn't even tell you the different things we've used them well, for because it, it, they all help so much with, even if you just need a hand, like an extra thing to hold, um, none of our hands, no, no matter who you are, can fit into that braille rider. And especially when you take it down as far as we do, sometimes you need that extra grip strength um, to hold those apart. And it's even 
really beneficial just the needle nose that Carl's holding now is to put those nuts and stick wax in that we were talking about earlier. Yep. You can still get in, I don't know if you guys can see, but I can get in there and pull them out. Um, what I like about these longer ones is they have a second pivot point. So what that means is I can make fine adjustments and get, I don't have to move my hands as far and I can already open those teeth. A regular needle nose has one pivot point is wider. The handles are wider than the teeth. So if I'm, my hand is down in a brailler, um, it's really hard to hold and, and open up. Whereas these, I've got a lot of grip. You can see we've used them a lot. They get really dirty, but they, um, I think they weren't too bad. Um, it was one of my first purchases because I was like, I got to get inside this thing. But they make straight needle nose and then a curved, um, all different grades as well. Um, snips too. Um, every once in a while, um, you, <laughs> something's jammed in there really bad. I, we've seen um, string in there. We've seen wire, um, twisty bread ties, all kinds of stuff. So snipping away at, at material and things like that, they get stuck in there um, is, is a, a bonus. Also, um, vice grips um, are come in handy to hold different things if you're cleaning them. Um, you can, you know, hold a screw and you can also adjust the tension if those who haven't used uh, vice grips before. These are a, a small needle nose pair. Um, so they're, they're nice as well. And I can get farther into the machine that way. Um, so Carl, well, I, had, I had somebody ask about the mainspring. Can you show them that tool real quick? So, uh, oh yeah, yeah, the some mainspring tool. The, some, some people in the chat are asking about the mainspring tool and how easy that okay. repair is to take the mainspring off. Um, Carl and I can do it fairly quickly, um, but we've also ourselves individually have run over 150 brailers in front of us. And so we're pretty proficient at it. Um, if you haven't been instructed on how to properly do it, and I'll say in person, um, I wouldn't suggest doing it just because there's a lot that could go wrong if you try and force things apart. Um, right. So we talked about that mainspring is under a lot of tension. And if you've attended one of our workshops in person in the past, you know that we're like, please be careful of the mainspring because all it is is a quarter inch width, probably if it was all the way pulled apart, three foot piece of wire that mm -hmm. is under high spring tension. Because if you think it needs that extra wind and that extra power to drive your carriage from left to right. And so when taking it apart, that, um, that entire tool that Carl's holding, Carl, can you show, uh, like put it over your right shoulder so people can see it? Um, that actually ends up going finagled. You loosen up that whole housing of the mainspring and before you pull it all off, you have to stick that tool in there because if you don't and that mainspring will unwind and has the possibility of um, catching a finger or like an eye or a face pretty good. Right. So like I said, it's about three feet long. And so even when it's unwound, it does have curls in it, but until you actually go through and- um, Did, did we like, show a, um, an actual um, mainspring off? Have we done that? The first- Day, okay, I it's on there. I just want to make sure. Yeah, just, we did. It's right we here. Asked yeah. about, we just asked about the tool and stuff. And so rewinding it, um, if you, I, in my opinion, I wouldn't try doing it yourself. And especially because if it unwinds improperly, um, it turns into a tangled, like, slinky mess. And so, so you, you have can... to, like, sit there and, like, rewind and do everything. Because it is possible to do it. But um, if you can't undo the slinky or you shoot that little um, circular nut, off into space, it will go everywhere. So Carl, so you, are you going to attempt to yeah, try and show it? I'm not going to attempt to try to show it. I just want you to understand what you're dealing with. When you see there's a sh the shaft that comes through the mainspring that's got a, a split in the shaft, which then goes through a collar. And then the collar also goes around the shaft as well as the inside of the spring goes through both of them. Now, what you'll see when I put the collar on it doesn't line up with the hole. It's resting position is towards one side of the inside of the cap. And so you've got to get eye level and manipulate this based on, it's all feel. I, I never looked, you can't see inside because this is literally covering up. So I catch it all by feel, maneuver it. And oh, by the way, you got to make sure this top part's facing up with, upwards and then get it all in. You don't use this tool putting it on, you use this tool getting it off. So what it does, is it slips around the collar and sandwiches the spring because they know as you back it out, there's tension on that spring. And what uh, Tim was talking about, that spring can then uncoil. So um, just, if you're gonna do it, be very, very careful um, doing mm -hmm. it.
especially if it's your uh, first time or you don't have experience or um, haven't attended a, a workshop in person. And, um, with, and, with Carl, and with Carl there, he can take that off and it's fine. I think in the past, we've kind of accidentally scared people and been like, it's not like a gun. It ain't going to go off at any second. Right. Like, you're fine. No. Um, as you see now, like Carl's putting painter's tape over it, but that's just precautionary. But And you you're welcome to tool. ask people that, that have right. attended uh, our workshops. I'm, I, you know, I, I'm curious to know how many have actually repaired it because it's and, difficult and you, to repair. Yeah, and you need that tool to take it off because if you don't and you start to back that mainspring out, mm -hmm. all that tension, it just starts to like, kind of tornado out towards the machine and if that end comes out of that post that's on that front assembly it's going to spring out and go everywhere okay um can is there any way we could talk to the person that mentioned um the braille rider when you turn over the paper guide fell out and i'm trying to understand what are we talking about if they raise their hands or they should be able to unmute themselves this, this little part is what we're talking about right the paper guide there <laughs> This is Miriam. Yes, it is. Okay. So um, what probably happened is this didn't get seated on the um, fire for the clink clank didn't get seated on the, um, the back plate well enough. Okay. And so when you put the, you already have the top plate on and buttoned down. Yes. Okay. So it could have been kind of cocked out that way. What I do is I try to, um, back that screw and the um, washer away and then let it rest in the groove on the back plate like we explained last time and it should just rest there. When you put the top plate on it should cover the brass part with the bevel, remember the beveled side needs to go in but the washer and the screw itself are outside of the brailler. Okay? Okay. So try try taking the top plate off again, replacing um, the um, the paper guide in position, and then button it down. And then I usually align the paper guide so it's in line with the the gap of the lever. That's just my default there. So when you're facing it, you kind of want it um, lined in that way. And then you can tighten down on that screw once you have the top plate tightened down, um, and it should hold. But you're, I have seen them pop out before that way. And what happens is it just gets kind of didn't quite rest when you're putting it on. You may have knocked it. It was barely hanging on. And then it falls out that way. Does that help? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay. And I think we answered all of the questions. We have five minutes to spare. Somebody give me a question because I'm ready. I want to know where the bell mechanism is. The bell mechanism. Good answer or good question. I'll give you a good answer. So the back plate on the back of the brailler. If we take the back plate off and examine it from the inside, you can see our margins. If you notice, um, we squeeze these tabs to move it. And this guy's really frustrating. We good? Can everybody hear me? I think so. Yeah, I think we can hear okay. you. Okay, cool. Um, so you can see it pinches and it moves the, um, the, the guides there. One does not have a bell. The, um, if you're facing the back of the barrel, the left one and our right, if we're facing the inside of the plate, does have a bell attached to it. What happens is the back of the um, um, embossing head has a little, uh, another cam back here that touches the, this little lever, which has a small, I don't know if you can see a small little tab and a spring. And so when it comes up, it throws it down to make the bell. If that bell isn't working, your spring could have popped off. This could have gotten bent. Um, you can, I mean, with not much pressure, you can see I can pull it, pull it out and actually make it go beyond the bell. Um, I'd be very careful. I've actually bent these too far. A little more pressure you can get it back in um, you may want to push it just a little bit not too much because again this distance is just in line so so that this little lever here hits that lever and so when it's traveling along it goes here 
this lever rides up underneath here. And as it passes and goes to the other end over here, so many inches from the side, you'll hear that classic bell sound. Okay, does that help? Yes, thank you. And so uh, one other tip too, um, grime builds up in there too. You've got a connection point where um, all kinds of debris and stuff can get in there. So get in there with, if you feel, you should be able to flick this and it should feel like you're riding an old school bike. Um, if, if it's stiff or slowly moves down and makes a, t a wrap, get in there with your alcohol again and, and, and clean, so. And someone did um, just ask for next week if they shove their broilers open. I'm gonna say it's up to you. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're gonna be just, next week is a big like troubleshooting. Make sure that anything the last three weeks that you've been like, they keep forgetting this, or <laughs> it's like Monday, and you're like, this is what I'm going to ask. And then it's Thursday and you went, I forgot to ask it. Write it down because we want to make sure that we cover it next week. Um, so it's going to be up to you if you want to have your Braille writer open as a reference point. Or if you maybe you have an open Braille writer that you're like, I stole this from a kid and he needs it back, but I'm using it for this workshop. Button it up and give it back to him. Absolutely. And I think I mentioned before, I don't know if I showed it, but um, you can see the Braille to my right is open. And like I said, if you guys are working on multiple where you just need to move it out of the way, um, these Braille paper um, thermoform, I think boxes, yeah, thermoform box are great for holding all the plates. So you can see they all fit in there. And then, like I mentioned, those containers, I even put some tape with the serial number so I know, know exactly what parts and screws. But all of the um, screws that are in this ice tray all fit in here. So. Um, so that's a helpful tip um, for keeping things organized. I didn't know if we had talked about that or not. So. Tim, anything else I can show them before uh, one minute <laughs> or I more? Think I, don't so. okay. I think we covered what uh, we had discussed last week after we were finished to make sure. And then we've answered everyone's questions. And like I said, I've been in the chat on and off. Um, some people asked about like, they can't wait for our next in-person one. And we're like, we can't either, but we're trying to figure it out still. Um, they also did mention like, well, the levels one, two, three, and four, um, that is a Perkins thing. Um, mm. We ourselves had to go to, we were in Boston for two weeks um, to get our level four certifications and to get that high and to do everything. Um, right now, they currently only offer a one through three. And then it's a like, you have to like pretty much rebuild everything from scratch and have to have the experience to get to that level four that Carl and I were at. Um, Carl is my Yoda. <laughs> well, and, and from my perspective, Luke Skywalker. And so <laughs> we are going through. And so to get like that cert, that certificate, that has to come from Perkins saying um, you were here and you learned levels one, two, and three. Right. Generally, yeah, you go and attend a two week um, session at Perkins. Um, and uh, that can get you up to level three, the one two week session. Um, to get to level four, we've had to go back. I went back again, and then um, lots and lots of communication, even video and um, explaining of skills, and um, and yeah, repair lots records, of challenging, yeah, repair records challenging. and everything. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but in all level four is, um, you know, it's just another level, basically saying you're a warranted um, repair person. Meaning, uh, if Perkins doesn't have the time to work on it, they'll ship stuff our way, and we can work on it. Um, level three essentially allows you to, you can start your own business. You can, um, you have the credibility to work on um, just about any, any classic brailler. I personally, I mean, they do cover smart brailers and um, a little bit of electric brailers and that kind of stuff. But I just, our um, fleet here is all classic for the most part. And I feel more comfortable with that. That's just what I, um, what we work on. So, um, but um, maybe in the future we'll, We'll expand our, our skills. But um, so, um, any yeah. other questions? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Tim and Carl. You did an amazing job again tonight. Um, I do want to review before we let everybody go. I want to say thank you if there are any veterans out there. Thank you for mm, being absolutely. Thank you for serving. I mean, we know it was Veterans Day, but we wanted to keep the day and time consistent. So um, I know some schools were not in session today. So uh thank you for coming today if that was the case for you <clears throat> the opening code i'm going to review was oil 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 
The closing code is Grease. G-R-E-A-S-E, Grease. I have added those to the chat box along with the form that you will fill out, um, which is a bit.ly link. You can just click on it and fill out the form for in-service credit. I am also going to add to the chat box our email address. So you can send um, any questions that you have for them next week. Like they said, they want it to be very interactive and to be able to answer and show you anything that you need. If you get it to us ahead of time, we can get it to them so they can have a little bit of a heads up and do some prep work ahead of time. Um, next week will be our fourth and final session. For now, at any rate, I have been to all of their in-person trainings and I did get to see the main <laughs> fly across the room and I got to rewind one and put it back together. Um, so that was, that was an experience and I loved every minute of it. So we're glad you're here. Come back next week for our last session. I am going to stop recording now.